Hello, so this lecture is about non-parametric methods and we're going to focus mostly on techniques that have become popular particularly in the last 10-15 years uh, called resampling but we are briefly going to start the session discussing other more familiar non-parametric methods. So from reading um, Howell in his chapter 18 talks about non-parametric approaches and he has uh, this PDF on rank statistics. Uh, on the VLE there's this paper by Conover and Iman from 1981 and then a classic old book by Ray Medis, psychologist. Um, and there are lots of websites um, providing programs uh, and you can see them in how and in the lab class the details. So as I said, there is resampling, which we'll talk about later as methods. We're going to start with talking about rank-based statistics. This is where, as the name implies, you take the data and you rank it first. Who's got the highest score, the second highest, and so on, on a DV, and then carry out statistics on the ranks rather than the raw scores. This issue will be familiar to you. Rank-based statistics that are taught, usually was one of the first things I learned as an undergraduate psychologist. Uh, it's taught early on in psychology undergrad degrees in things like the Wilcoxon rank sum test which is a one way between subjects design it's two levels it's actually identical to the Crystal Wallace test but the Crystal Wallace can be extended beyond that to two plus levels um, and there's also one way within subjects design so these just map exactly equivalently onto the way if uh, you would use a t-test in parametric statistics. There's also more from famous Wilcoxon sign ranks match pairs test. This this one up here is also known as a man Whitney EU test as well. They're identical. And Friedman's test is the extension for two plus level. So those familiar designs that most people are taught in early on in undergraduate psychology, you'll notice that they're all one way simple designs, the equivalent of t-tests or one-way anovas, and sometimes you're also taught a correlational method, Spearman's method, or as an alternative to the parametric Pearson method. Obviously, psychology often uses uh, factorial or other designs or wants to ask other statistical questions. So here, the approach by Conover and Iman, and indeed Medis's book, where he gathers together all specific formulae that are in the old literature but doing more complex non-parametric statistics offer a method to do these other designs. So as a simple solution what Conover and Iman uh, write in their paper is to see ranking as a transformation of the data like uh, other transformations where you're trying to improve the condition of the data so that you can carry out parametric tests and what they've shown uh, systematically is that many well-known rank tests, you know, the named ones, are actually equivalent to ranking the scores of the subjects and then performing the standard parametric test for that situation on the ranks. So if we have uh, between subjects two level design and we don't feel comfortable doing parametric statistics, we can rank the scores and then carry out a t-test on those ranks and that will be equivalent to doing the calculation for um, the Wilcoxon rank sum test or the uh, Man Whitney as it's sometimes known. So and they showed Conover and Iman that this is true across a wide range of um, uh, test and design scenarios. So if you rank the data and do a Pearson correlation on that that's the same as doing the Spearman correlation. But they went on to look at factorial designs, regression, a number of other procedures to show that this method rank the data and then perform the parametric test you would have performed on it had the data been better conditioned. This uh, is a general approach you can use. Now this puzzles some people because they know something about, they've been introduced to the notion of uh, a non-parametric test and they're told, hmm, you, you can't do a non-parametric test here because the data don't fit the assumptions. Typically, they're not normally distributed. An important point here 
is that it isn't the data that have to be normally distributed, but for typical parametric tests, the statistics is based on, say, the means. So the sampling distribution of the mean has to be normally distributed. It turns out, under something called the central limit theorem, the central theorem of statistics, that if you have normally distributed data, then the uh, sampling distribution of the mean will be guaranteed to be normally distributed. And an important additional fact is that for many types of distribution of data, but not all, uh, as long as you have uh, a, uh, even a quite modest sample size, 10, 20 participants cases, then as long as the distributions are not extremely distorted, very, very skewed or bimodal, things like that, if you have mo many distributions, including like a rank distribution, then the sampling distribution of the mean will indeed be normal. You can easily illustrate that by simulating data. Um, and we know that a rank distribution isn't normal, it's a uniform. If you've got 10 participants and you rank them you know, one to 10 in terms of their performance, they are, you know, a 10th of the subject have a rank of one. It's a uniform distribution. Obviously, there can be ties, and that changes it very slightly. But in general, it's a pretty well-behaved distribution. And you can carry out parametric st statistics on it. And the p-values that they yield will not be wildly invalid. So that's the logic of doing this. So we'll do an example. This was uh, a real data set, but it had a complicated cover story. So I made up this cover story, which is easy to follow. It's about competition and gender effects on learning. It's a two-way between subjects design. So everyone's assigned to two learning conditions, uh, random competitive learning versus the control condition. And there are um, males and females. And within the males, they're randomly assigned to one of these two conditions. And in the females, they're randomly assigned to one of these two conditions. If we look at the data, we can see this is a learning task. And it's measured by... It takes quite a while to learn. You set some criterion by which you judge the person has learned the task well, like five correct responses in a row or whatever. And you measure how many trials of the task. It's a sort of trial and error, guesswork initially, a learning task. You take how many trials you take to reach that criterion. And what we found in these data is that there's you know, a distribution of people who learn you know, somewhere between 50 and 100 trials. And the experiment only ran for 150 trials because it's just, you know, and then it stopped. And there was definitely a second sort of group of subjects who don't learn in the maximum trials, maximum number of trials. So they get a score of 150, which is obviously an underestimate. Their scores would have been longer had we had more patients. So clearly this is an unusual distribution. And it's a mixed distribution of, of presumably two learning learning groups, one who learn with varying degrees of speed and another group who, at least in the experiment, don't learn at all. Um, they don't meet the criterion. So this sort of distribution wouldn't have well-behaved statistics parametrically. So we can uh, treat it non-parametrically by ranking it and do uh, an analysis to look at the specific hypothesis was would uh, competition uh, have a differential effect uh, for men and women. Uh, it's quite hard to see here. Okay, this group in males do get a bit faster, and there's fewer who fail to learn. It looks to be much less of an effect in women. We can look at it in a traditional way using means, and we do seem to have the interaction the number of trials to criterion. The men in the competition do faster than the, uh, than the control men, and there's little effect if anything goes the other way for women so we can do an interaction and because the data are, are ill suited to parametric statistics what we've done here we get an interaction but it's it's modest it's not formally significant so we could improve our lot by treating these data in a rank based way uh, and most of the familiar tests that we learn about are not multi-factorial designs are just one way as I've already said so um, here's what you can do with rank-based statistics so we rank all the subjects on the DB 
it's the number of trials to the criterion and we make the fastest learner have a rank of 101 and the slowest learner have a rank of one it's arbitrary we just remember which way around we did it and there'll be a few ties there'll be a few subjects who have exactly the same number of trials to criterion and we just treat those give the rank uh, the average of the ranks of the subjects so if there is somebody tied for second and third place they each get a rank of two and a half we perform normal two-way ANOVA on the ranks we can look at the histograms these are the, the ranks of the trials to criterion score and the males in the competition uh, have ranks that go somewhere between the, the slowest and one of the fastest learners uh, in the control group they don't have so many fast learners they have more down at the slow learning end with the low numbered ranks and the um, female participants they have uh, some slow learners down in the competition and more fast uh, a skew in general towards faster learners in the control condition but there's not a lot of difference I think and these distributions are a bit better conditioned so that if we did an analysis of variance on those it's going to be it won't meet the assumptions perfectly the analysis has been shown to be robust so now we do it on the ranks is the means this is the mean rank so the males in competition the mean rank is like 56 remember 100 is the fastest soaring subject and in the control condition somewhat worse slower rank in the mid 30s and there's a little effect for women you know, a difference between the conditions there low to mid 50s now remember the average person if there were no differences there are 101 participants so the average rank would be 51 the average rank is between 1 and 101 so you add the two numbers together you get 102 divide by 2 is 51 so it looks like there might be an interaction when we look at it using ANOVA the same ANOVA but now on the rank data we see evidence slightly stronger effect and I chose found these data because they illustrated it quite nicely it moves from not being significant before I think the P was just under 0.1 and now being formally significant clearly there was evidence of an effect and this just is a more powerful reliable way of getting at the effect and that's it for this section of the talk